And thank you, everyone. We are at 38 after the hour. And we'll now reconvene the meeting to begin public comments. Um, I'd like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. Your comments are very important to us. All the speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was um, determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period in, or in order to make it through all the listed speakers. It's extremely important that each speaker limits his or her remarks to three minutes. We will be displaying a timer on the screen so you know how much time you have left. Thank you again to our speakers, and we look forward to your comments. And um, making sure that I have the list. Okay, I believe I have uh, Mr. Robert Blancato first. Mr. Blancato. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you for present. Thank you for another opportunity to present to you. My name is Bob Blancato, representing the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Programs. First, I commend ACIP for the extraordinary work you have done throughout the pandemic work that has certainly has saved lives. My point is simple and straightforward. Please, during this meeting, recommend the use of two new and improved pneumococcal vaccines so they can be used in time for this upcoming flu and pneumonia season, especially for older adults. I make this request together with the National Council on Aging, the National Alliance for Caregiving, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, U.S. Aging, the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging, Generations United, the Caregiver Action Network, the Vietnam Veterans of America, and the Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement. The earlier presentation by the pneumococcal work group makes an extremely strong case that at least for the 65 plus population, you could in fact approve the vaccines today. Both of these new and improved vaccines were approved by the FDA this summer. In addition, both have signed, shown early positive results that they can be administered together with a flu vaccine. A more active influenza and pneumonia season is inevitable as our nation slowly returns to more normal social interaction in various settings. Pneumonia is inexorably linked to the flu. Pre-pandemic, some 1.5 million persons per year sought care from hospital emergency departments due to pneumonia. Deaths from these two diseases once were the ninth leading cause of death in the United States. Another compelling reason to recommend approval now is CDC's own guidance that pneumonia vaccines can be administered along with COVID vaccines. As more Americans, especially older Americans, either get their first or second dosages or their boosters, it would be such a convenience to have both done it on the same visit. Another new but critical consideration for having the most current vaccines is data from a study of 5,000 older adults, which showed that persons 65 to 75 who received the pneumococcal vaccine reduced the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by 30%. When this panel approved the pneumococcal vaccine in 2014, followed by a decision by CMS to provide coverage, it led to almost a doubling of older adults on Medicare getting pneumococcal vaccines. I urge ACIP to move with the same incredible speed that it has throughout the pandemic, and this time expedite the approval of these new and improved pneumococcal vaccines. Just as your work has been pivotal to more than 213 million Americans having received at least one COVID-19 vaccine, deciding to recommend approval today for these pneumococcal vaccines could result in millions of older adults getting this critical vaccine. Finally, recommending these vaccine addresses another important public health issue, preventing further social isolation of older adults. A tragic pandemic should not be followed by a twindemic later this year and early next. That can be averted by ACIP moving today to approve vaccines that can prevent this deadly disease from impacting older adults. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Ms. Alicia Malonga. Oh, great. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Alicia Malanga, and I'm pleased to be able to represent the COPD Foundation and highlight the written comments submitted to the ACIP by our Chief Medical Officer. The COPD Foundation is dedicated to preventing COPD, bronchiectasis, and non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease. We strive to improve the lives of those affected and seek cures. The COPD Foundation represents more than 16 million Americans diagnosed with COPD and countless more at risk. We strongly support the work of the ACIP and are grateful for the critical efforts required from the group. My purpose today is to strongly advocate for a simplified age-based vaccine recommendation for the prevention of pneumococcal disease, including pneumococcal pneumonia in adults. While well-intentioned, the current recommendations, including shared clinical decision-making, has generated confusion. In addition, under the current recommendations, 
individuals with chronic underlying conditions, including COPD, under the age of 65 are not addressed. Overall, individuals with COPD have more pneumonia, suffer from more severe episodes of pneumonia, experience more hospitalizations, greater burden, and worse outcomes compared to those without COPD. Sentiment around pneumonia on COPD360 Social, the foundation's online community of over 51,000 individuals, highlights the fear of getting pneumonia and the hope that it can be prevented. We understand from the July 2021 ACIP meeting that there has been a demonstrated cost effectiveness of PCV20 without the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine in individuals 50 and over and in individuals 65 and over. The data also suggests a demonstrated cost effectiveness of PCV15 without the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine in individuals 65 and over. These data strongly support the COPD Foundation's request that the ACIP implement a simplified age-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendation that also includes a risk-based recommendation for individuals with chronic underlying conditions, including COPD, who do not meet the age requirement of 50 or 65, respectively. Now, more than ever, vaccines and protecting lung health is essential. We need to ensure that we equip our community with clear vaccine guidelines that incorporate at-risk populations, including those with COPD. Thank you for the opportunity to share the impact of your recommendations. We stand ready to assist in providing additional information. Thank you for your comments. We'll move on next to Mr. Burton Eller. Mr. Eller? today to raise our concern about the continued threat from COVID-19 in combination with what is expected to be an active influenza and pneumonia season this fall and winter. Our National Grange President, Betsy Huber, recently wrote in an opinion piece in The Hill laying out the unique challenges rural Americans face and why they could be especially vulnerable during the upcoming flu season. Some of these include the fact that a quarter of rural residents live in counties with high mortality rate due to underlying medical conditions. Additionally, it is harder for rural residents to access care as 181 rural hospitals have closed permanently in the U.S. since, night, since 2015. And nearly one in five rural Americans continue to lack access to high-speed broadband, prohibiting virtual physician visits. While certainly more challenging for those in rural America, we know that keeping up with routine checkups and vaccinations could mean life and death for so many vulnerable Americans. Given the FDA's recent approval of two new vaccines for pneumonia, which cover more variants of the virus than the currently available vaccines, our communities are eager to gain access to this broader protection. We have already heard from several of our members expressing their hopes that the new vaccines are available before the upcoming flu and new pneumonia season including from one individual who lost their older brother to pneumonia at age 40. We, explore, we implore this committee to expedite this process and ensure the at-risk population and vulnerable Americans across the country, ages 15 and over, pardon me, ages 50 and over, will have access to the most effective vaccines before the flu and pneumonia season is underway. We thank you for the ongoing commitment to protecting Americans against COVID-19 and appreciate all of the progress that has already been made in ensuring access to effective preventative vaccines to protect ourselves. Just as we are laser focused on increasing COVID-19 vaccination rates, we remain diligent in ensuring that we are using every tool available to protect against pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next, we'll move to Dr. Rita Kuwahara. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dr. Rita Kobahara. I'm a primary care internal medicine physician and health policy fellow at Georgetown University. I'm here today to provide evidence for why an updated recommendation for universal adult hepatitis B vaccination is not only a crucial step to protecting the health of my patients and community, but is an issue of health equity and gives us the essential tool we need to significantly increase the current adult hepatitis B vaccination rate of only 25% to finally eliminate hepatitis B in the U.S. 
As a physician, I'd like to urge you to vote in favor of recommending universal adult hepatitis B vaccination. We are at a critical time in our nation's history with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the surging opioid epidemic, and widening racial health disparities, and actions we take now to improve the public health of our nation will have long-lasting effects on the health outcomes of each person in our country. Up to 2.4 million people in the U.S. are chronically infected with hepatitis B. One in four people with unmanaged chronic hepatitis B will develop liver cancer, liver failure, and or cirrhosis. And liver cancer only has an 18% five-year survival rate. Prior to COVID-19, regions of our country most affected by the opioid epidemic saw alarming rises in acute hepatitis B of up to 100 to 700%. The worsening opioid epidemic has resulted in further rises with 36% of all new acute hepatitis B infections in the U.S. attributed to the opioid epidemic. Hepatitis B is vaccine preventable, and since we have highly effective vaccines, there should not be a single new infection of hepatitis B in our nation. However, since only 25% of adults are vaccinated, we are seeing continued rises in infections, and we must do everything in our power to prevent additional outbreaks within the opioid epidemic and COVID-19 pandemic. As a primary care physician, my number one priority is optimizing the health of my patients and ending the transmission of vaccine-preventable infectious diseases is paramount to achieving this. When I see patients in clinic, I'm caring for individuals with increasingly complex health and social needs. With the current risk-based approach to hepatitis B vaccination, it makes it impossible to have automatic alerts to vaccinate patients, leaving our most vulnerable patients without protection against hepatitis B and associated liver cancer, since hepatitis B disproportionately affects communities such as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, African immigrants, incarcerated individuals, and persons who inject drugs who may not have the knowledge and empowerment to ask for the hepatitis B vaccine. If universal vaccination is recommended, we would not have this problem and create automatic prompts to ensure all of our patients are protected. In a survey of internal medicine physicians I conducted at my community health center, we found that none of the survey physicians knew that the adult hepatitis B vaccination rate is only 25%, so vaccines were rarely ordered. Since every unvaccinated person is at risk of infection, we must increase provider awareness, protect the health of our most vulnerable patients, and prevent outbreaks in our communities through increased vaccination, best achieved through a recommendation for universal adult hepatitis B vaccination, which can also allow us to finally eliminate hepatitis B. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next is Ms. Catherine Falk. Hi, I'm back. I'm Catherine Falk, a parent and vaccine advocate in Oakland, California. Thank you again for all your hard work, which this time is about vaccines other than those against uh, COVID-19. I cannot speak to the data on the vaccines you're discussing. I'm glad that you're discussing them because with all the focus on COVID-19, we still can't lose sight of the many other preventable diseases out there. Speaking of which, it would be nice if it wasn't just left to the market to drive the timeline of the development of new vaccines. We could use a more effective flu vaccine, and it would be wonderful if that childhood scourge RSV could be prevented with a vaccine too. And while I know you're not talking about COVID-19 vaccines today, I hope that when the data on younger children arrives on your doorstep, you'll be able to review and approve it as efficiently as possible without sacrificing the thorough work you always do to assess risks and benefits. But I'm mainly here today to tell you I shouldn't be here. I want to reiterate Mr. Nuremberg's and Professor Rice's prior comments. Anti-vaccine advocates take advantage of this oral public comment opportunity to disseminate rapid fire disinformation so they can reuse their audio clips in marketing and social media campaigns. You had a demonstration of this just last week when one of the public commenters rattled off a bunch of death reports with zero evidence of causation. Misused bears recommended people take ivermectin, engaged in conspiracy theorizing, and advertised his blog's URL free of charge in this forum, all in the space of three minutes. This is, to put it mildly, unhelpful. While it's important to let members of the public weigh in, we could also do so in writing. There is no benefit to giving an opportunity to grandstand to people who cite VAERS, unverified reports, and scare people into leaving themselves and their families and communities unprotected from disease. Nobody should pretend that we public commenters are actually sitting on the ASIP panel as equal meeting participants. Maybe when you get some free time, I know, you can look at changing the comments format. I will also reiterate that I hope the committee is given the resources and opportunity to communicate clearly and widely to the public about vaccine, vaccine science and the vaccine approval process. There is a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Michaela Jackson. Good afternoon. 
My name is Michaela Jackson. I am the Prevention Policy Manager for the Hepatitis B Foundation. Today, we urge ACIP to recommend universal hepatitis B vaccination for all adults. Earlier this year, a new study by the Hepatitis B Foundation and Partners found that up to 2.4 million Americans are living with hepatitis B, a number that is greater than previous estimates. When this number is considered along with the recent rise in acute Hep B cases and the low adult Hep B vaccination rate, it is clear that Hep B remains a problem in the U.S. despite highly effective vaccines. When considering the proposed recommendation, it is imperative that the committee recommends universal vaccination for all adults instead of limiting it to those 59 years of age and under. The most recent viral hepatitis surveillance report shows that adults 60 and older have seen a slight but steady increase in Hep B cases since 2014. This rise is particularly concerning in view of the COVID-19 pandemic, as many essential public health services and facilities were closed for extended periods of time. We know that current risk risk guidelines are ineffective and missed opportunities to vaccinate can be expensive. The CDC's Division of STD Prevention reported that new sexually transmitted Hep B cases accounted for $46 million in direct medical costs in 2018, a significant number for a disease that can be prevented. Furthermore, research shows that people who experience liver complications that can occur in Hep B patients, such as decomposited liver, liver cancer, or liver trans transplants, accrue the highest annual healthcare costs in the U.S. With a lack of clear surveillance and a lack of universal screening combined with underreported Hep B cases, this means that, along with chronic hepatitis B patients, those who are unaware that they have recovered from an acute case can still be at risk for activation and potential liver problems later in life. Universal prevention is the best way to keep costs low for both the government and the individual. In a time where public health is facing the culmination of many long-standing battles, this is a battle that can be easily won. The hepatitis B community feels strongly that a universal recommendation is a priority that cannot be delayed. We wait in anticipation for the committee's final vote this October. I'd like to thank the committee for your continuous efforts to better public health and for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, the last public commenter is Mr. Cubero Jimenez. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jen, and I'm speaking on behalf of Retire State. Retire Safe is a nonprofit organization whose mission it is to educate and advocate on behalf of older Americans on issues including Social Security, Medicare, health, safe retirement, and financial well-being. I speak not only as a public policy intern, but as a son of two parents nearing retirement age and the grandson of three grandparents who are eager to spend time with their children and grandchildren as well as enjoy their retirement outside of their homes. Currently, there are 70 million Americans over the age of 60 due to immune system decline as part of aging as well as the prevalence of chronic disease comorbidities. Many of them are particularly vulnerable to infectious disease such as influenza, pneumococcal pneumonia, and of course, COVID-19. Vaccines for these and other conditions can truly be a matter of life or death, and we are, greatly, uh, and we are grateful for the continued work by the ACIP uh, to evaluate and approve critical vaccines for COVID-19. Retire Safe has a long history of informing and educating American seniors of the uh, important role vaccines play in maintaining our long-term health, and our members are committed to taking the steps necessary to protect against preventable illnesses. While we are encouraged by the progress made to, toward vaccinating older Americans against COVID-19, we are increasingly concerned that experts are predicting the flu and pneumonia season to be more serious than last year, now that states across the country are relaxing COVID-19 restrictions. In the U.S., it is estimated that more than 150,000 hospitalizations from pneumococcal pneumonia occur each year, and about 5-7% to 7 of those who are hospitalized from it will die. Given the increased vulnerability for older Americans and in light of the two new and improved vaccines for pneumonia, we are particularly focused on what is being done to ensure we are doing everything possible to protect America's seniors. This, this, this new vaccines offer hope of even greater protection against uh, life-threatening disease for some of the most vulnerable in our population, but only if they have access to them. We urge this committee to consider expediting the vote on these vaccines for adults age 50 and over and the at-risk community ahead of this year's flu and pneumonia season. In closing, I would like to share that we heard from one gentleman living in San Antonio, Texas named Joe Velasquez. Mr. Velasquez is a 78 year old diabetic who wrote to us that he's eager for access to these new vaccines uh, because he is not only concerned about protecting himself, but also his family members, including his daughter who suffers from ALS and her husband who has severe asthma. We are hopeful that Joe and the millions of other seniors across the country who will desperately want to protect themselves ahead of this year's uh, flu and pneumonia season will have access to the best tools to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you very much for your comments. And I want to thank our public comment speakers uh, for contributing to this conversation. Um, at this time, what I'd like to do is uh, move on uh, to Merck and then Pfizer. I'm going to ask if you can please limit your comments to two to three minutes. We are uh, uh, trying to make sure that we can get through all of the agenda items for today. And I also want to preserve a little time for a few more questions from our ACIP members and liaison. So uh, I will ask uh, the representative from Merck if they would like to make a few comments now. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee. This is uh, Rick Hap. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I head up the Global Medical Affairs for Infectious Disease at Merck. I want to thank the ACIP uh, for the opportunity to make public comment. I also want to thank the work group for their um, great efforts in supporting recommendations for adult pneumococcal vaccination. I had some remarks prepared um, for today's presentation, but before I do that, very quickly, I just wanted to address something that came up, and that's the issue of... Um, <clears throat> immune tolerance and and you know, we there is data we have data with uh revaccination with the polysaccharide at intervals going out to five years that shows no evidence of hypo responsiveness so i'm concerned that this issue of immune tolerance is um taking on a bigger role than it should be we'd be glad to share that data with the, the work group in the future but um with that i couldn't uh, i couldn't let that pass so my comments regarding today, we really appreciate the changes that were made to the health economic model based on scientific evidence and feedback received in the June meeting. We are disappointed that the work group excluded PCV only strategy and age-based recommendations. Based on our analyses, the PCV only strategy was cost savings in 65 years of age and older across all scenarios, including the scenario that incorporated most of the CDC assumptions. Um, as presented today, both policy options proposed by the work group in adults 65 years of age are economically favorable and cost savings. It's important to note that they do have different profiles, a single vaccination covering 20 PCV types or sequential PCV 15 polysaccharide 23 regimen that has broader coverage and robust immunogenicity, especially against serotype 3. I'd also note that PCV 15 is the only vaccine that has generated comprehensive clinical data in immunocompromised and at-risk populations. So consideration of both policy options by the ACIP allows healthcare providers to have the opportunity to select the most appropriate regimen um, considering the uh, profile of the individual being vaccinated. Um, also, consistent with the desire of the work group to ensure a simplified recommendation that would ensure better coverage and avoid confusion among healthcare providers, we suggest that both the 50 and 65 age-based recommendations consider the PCV15 polysaccharide sequential regimen, as well as the PCV20 policy regimen. Um, different recommendations in 50 and 65-year-old age groups may lead to more confusion of healthcare providers, and as noted earlier, may need or necessitate the need for booster doses at age 65 or even possibly earlier. And then my last comment, uh, and I think it was good to see this as a next step by the work group, the intervals for the PCV polysaccharide sequential regimen in the at-risk and the age-based categories are different. It's eight weeks in immunocompromised individuals and it's a year or more in immunocompetent individuals. Merck has generated safety and immunogenicity data that demonstrates that the polysaccharide vaccine can be given as early as four weeks following a PCV dose in immunocompetent adults. And we respectfully request that the work group considers harmonizing the timing of those intervals in the sequential recommendation in both categories in an effort to simplify the recommendations and, and likely facilitate series completion. So again, thank you to the work group and the ACIP for all their efforts in the adult policy world. Uh, we look forward to working with the work group as they begin deliberations in the pediatric pneumococcal vaccine, which is coming after the, this adult um, uh, adventure ends in October. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hopson. Thank you for keeping your comments brief. Um, I'll look to the representative from Pfizer if they would like to say a few words. Yes, can you hear me, Dr. Lee? Yes, we can. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandro Cane. I am the Medical and Scientific Affairs Lead for Vaccines uh, in Pfizer in North America. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. We would like to provide some brief comments and an update on, on our clinical development program for PCB20 adults. Firstly, I would like to remind you that approximately 30% of our subjects under 65 years of age in our phase three clinical trial had a chronic medical condition. Secondly, during today's presentation of the evidence to recommendation framework, 
when providing a summary assessment on the certainty of evidence for PCB20 effectiveness, some work group members expressed concerns about the lower immunogenicity observed for PCB20 versus PCB13 recipients. We would like to reiterate that PCB20 immune responses met non-inferiority criteria for all of the shared serotypes in PCB13 and met also non-inferiority criteria for all the shared serotypes with PPSV23, except for serotype 8 that, as you know, fulfill all the criteria required by the FDA for approval. Third, regarding the uncertainty noted around potential future effectiveness of PCB20 in adults, we also would like to point out that a similar immunogenicity pattern was seen in the pediatric population when moving from PCB7, which we all know is proven to be effective uh, against IPD and pneumonia, to PCB13. That is a modestly lower GMC for PCB13 versus PCB7 recipient. And yet, PCB13 was shown to be highly effective at the individual and population level. While there is no correlate of protection in adults, PCB20 is being compared to a vaccine with proven efficacy, which is similar to the process that we follow with PCB13 evaluation. Specifically, a large randomized clinical trial conducted in Netherlands among adults 65 years of age and over demonstrated that PCB13 is efficacious against IPD and non-invasive pneumonia for vaccine serotypes, including serotype 3. These data are supported by similar results from several subsequent effectiveness studies. Therefore, PCB20 will likely have similar efficacy to PCB13. It's also important to point out that these transitions from PCB7 to PCB17 and now from PCB13 to PCB20 are being made for a vaccine made by the same manufacturer using the similar processes and the unique technologies as the prior vaccines with proven efficacy. We would like to reassure the ACIP that we are committed to conducting a confirmatory effectiveness study of the PCB20 adults in the U.S. population once the recommendations become final. Of course, we look forward to sharing the results of this study with the ACIP sometime in the future. Finally, I really would like to say thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today and thank you for your careful and transparent consideration of the evidence for pneumococcal vaccines in adults, especially while in the midst of the pandemic response. Thank you again, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kande. Um, I wanted to uh, reopen and ask Dr. Kobayashi uh, uh, to also uh, rejoin us to ask if there are any additional questions. I do have one I wanted to um, get on the table, one comment and one question, which is, um, you know, it strikes me that the most effective way we're going to be able to reduce the burden of pneumococcal disease in um, high-risk populations and older adult populations is through a childhood vaccination program. And that does seem to me um, both most impactful, but also most cost efficient. Uh, in the interim, it seems that the adult vaccination programs that are laid out um, can offer additional individual level protection. So uh, I, would, I would, and I remember seeing this in prior meetings, but I didn't see as much of it today, but I, I would like a better understanding of serotype three and the impact of um, 13, 15, and 20 on uh, the potential for serotype three prevention, since that seems to be a significant serotype uh, causing invasive pneumococcal disease in high-risk populations. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Dr. Fryhofer. Hi, Sandra Fryhofer. Um, I'm a liaison for the American Medical Association, but I'm speaking as a general internist who cares for a lot of patients with multiple medical problems. And I certainly understand firsthand the burden of pneumococcal disease and the importance of pneumococcal vaccination. And I'm very excited about these new, uh, these new vaccines and their expanded coverage for more serotypes. Um, the current pneumococcal recommendation is one of the most complicated, or is the most complicated vaccine recommendation in the adult schedule. But I must, must say, after hearing today's presentation, I'm not sure that what's been proposed is going to simplify that process. I will remain hopeful and hope in October everything will become crystal clear and what ACIP comes up with as its final recommendations will be easier to implement than the current schedule. But thank you so much for today's presentations. Um, thank you, Dr. Feinhofer. Um, any last comments from Dr. Kobayashi or Dr. Paling? Uh, not for me. Right. Thank you very much for all the comments. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I see Ms. McNally has her hand raised. Dr. Lee, is it possible in October for us to also receive an overview of educational information that would be available for patients to understand the recommendations, the proposed recommendations as well? 
Um, thank you for your comment. Um, oh, sorry, uh, should I respond or uh, Dr. Lee? No, go ahead, Dr. Kamashi. Okay. Yes. Um, so to um, to partially maybe answer your question, you know, one of the things that the work group is considering is to um, think about a, uh, like a draft of a clinical guidance, you know, especially focusing on people who previously received uh, pneumococcal vaccines that are currently recommended. So in that context, you know, hopefully that will provide some um, information about what kind of um, guidance will be provided, if not final. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, I see Dr. Goldman's hands raised, and, um, uh, and I think this will be the last comments, unless any other ACF members wish to, wish to raise their hand. Um, I do think just I wanted to comment that I think it's going to be uh, complicated to provide patient education when uh, it is not clear sort of what the recommendations will look like. So, uh, you know, very much, again, encourage uh, individuals to ask questions to help the work group clarify the direction that the ACFP members are leaning uh, for the October meeting. Uh, Dr. Goldman. Thank you. I'll be real brief. You know, in the thought process on simplification from a physician office standpoint, the market itself may just bear out if all things being equal, um, physicians may choose to get one vaccine over the other, and that may make it even simpler in how we implement. So just keeping that, even though we're not supposed to compare vaccines, the market may do that for us. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Thanks. I just and I'm, I keep hearing, and I agree with that we do need to simplify this, but um, per the current PICO questions, I just see a lot of complications in terms of 50 versus 65. Um, you know, those who received it earlier will not get the other vaccine later, or if, like Dr. Roman mentioned, if it's only one vaccine that, 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 that um, office has, um, it's going to be problematic because then those 50 to 65 may not, they may have to wait. I, I, I all my comment is that, and I, I sympathize with the work group because I understand the complexity and the problems, but I think that it really does need to be, uh, we need to harmonize the, the age groups. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I believe that's the last hand that I see raised. So the committee will now move on to the hepatitis B vaccine session. Um, I want to ask Dr. Kevin Alt, who's chair of the work group, to provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Dr. Alt. Thank you for that. I don't want to spend too much time on these introductory slides since we're running a little bit behind, but I would like to everybody to remind everybody that uh, we are part of a larger effort as outlined by HHS to eliminate uh, hepatitis B in our country. And so this is the question that we're gonna be talking about at this meeting and upcoming meetings and also the question we've been talking about for the past couple of years that I've been on ACIP. Next slide, please. And so back in February, we talked about the background and the economic evaluation. And today we're gonna to be talking about uh, post-marketing safety surveillance study for the uh, adjuvanted uh, hepatitis B vaccine, as well as great and evidence to recommendation. Dr. Deshani and Dr. Bucksfort will be our speakers today. And we're doing this in anticipation of having a vote at the regularly scheduled October meeting towards the end of the month of October. Next slide, please. Similar to what other uh, working group chairs have said, this is uh, a lot of people involved as liaison representatives, ex officio members, uh, consultants, and ACIP voting members. And I wanted to especially thank Dr. Wang for his uh, efforts to lead our group as the CDC lead. Next slide. And I want to acknowledge uh, the people on, on this slide for helping make this work uh, possible and uh, giving presentations at prior meetings. And I think that's my last slide, so I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lee. Thanks, Dr. Alt. Um, and we'll move on to Dr. Katya Buxvort from Kaiser Permanente, Southern California. Good afternoon. Today, I'll be presenting the final results of a post licensure vaccine safety study of a two dose hepatitis B vaccine, Teplosat B, focused on acute myocardial infarction. Next. The study was funded by Dynavax Technologies, and I received 
a research support unrelated to this study from the other companies listed here. Next. Peplosav B is a two-dose vaccine administered at zero and one month in comparison to another hepatitis B vaccine, Indirex B, which is a three-dose vaccine administered at zero, one, and six months. Peplosav B has a novel PLR9 agonist adjuvant, cytosine phosphoguanine 1018, whereas Indirex B has an LM adjuvant. In pre-licensure clinical trials, Peplosab B generated higher and earlier seroprojection compared to Indirex B. Um, but in a single clinical trial, there was a numerical imbalance in acute myocardial infarction, or AMI. These AMI events occurred in subjects in whom such events would be expected based on their high prevalence of baseline cardiovascular risk factors, and they occurred randomly with no uh, relationship to time of vaccine administration at lower than expected incidence rates. However, um, this imbalance prompted a post-licensure safety study to be required as part of Peplosat B licensure. Next. So that's how we at Kaiser Permanente Southern California Department of Research and Evaluation came on board to conduct this real-world post-licensure safety study with the objective of comparing the occurrence of AMI in recipients of Peplosat B and recipients of Indirex B. Next. I'd like to briefly describe the timeline for Heplosat B licensure and recommendation. So in July 2018, BRPAC voted 12 to 1 that the Heplosat B safety data supported licensure. The original PDUFA date was extended to November 2017, while the details of the required post-marketing safety study were worked out. The BLA was in November 2017. And in February 2018, ACIP recommended Heplosat B for use in adults. The recommendation was published in April 2018, which then allowed us at KPSC to begin planning for implementation of Heplosat B. And we began uh, using Heplosat B in August of 2018. Next. Kaiser Permanente Southern California, or KPSC, is a large, diverse, integrated healthcare system serving 4.7 million members with diverse racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. There are 15 medical centers spread over Southern California, and each with a hospital and surrounding medical offices. And we administer a large number of vaccines every year. Uh, we also have a comprehensive electronic health record system, which captures details of patient care. And vaccines are offered proactively at, at every visit and at walk-in clinic visits. Um, electronic alerts are in place, which help identify patients who can benefit from vaccination, and this includes an alert for hepatitis B vaccination for patients with diabetes. Next. So our study used non-randomized cluster design in which Heplosat B became the only hepatitis B vaccine available in family and internal medicine departments at seven of the 15 KPSC medical centers. The other eight medical centers continue to use Indirex B in family and internal medicine departments. Um, this was a real-world study, uh, so hepatitis B vaccines were administered as part of the routine care delivery from August of 2018 to October of 2019. And then individuals were passively followed through the electronic health records for 13 months after the first dose administered during the study accrual period, which was the index dose. Next. The primary outcome was the first occurrence of definite or probable type 1 AMI, as defined by the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction, during the 13-month follow-up period after the index date. And potential AMI events were identified by ICD-10 diagnosis codes from inpatient care emergency department visits with the same or next day death. A documentation of potential AMI events for hospitals outside of KPSC was captured from a claim. All events were adjudicated by two cardiologist reviewers who were masked to vaccine group and to each other, and I'll talk more about this, and study progress and results were reviewed by an independent data monitoring committee. Next. And to adjudicate AMI events, cardiologist reviewers were asked to use the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction to classify potential AMI events as definite AMI, probable AMI, insufficient information to determine, or not AMI. For definite or probable AMI, reviewers were asked to determine the type of AMI. K 
cases with disagreement from two cardiologist reviewers went to a third reviewer as a tiebreaker. And then cases with disagreement from all three reviewers were considered indeterminate. Next. This was a non-inferiority study designed to rule out a doubling of the rate of AMI in Hepatitis B versus indirect B recipients. We used Cox proportional hazards regression with inverse probability of treatment weighting, IPTW, to adjust for confounding. IPTW also uh, lets us assess the degree of control of imbalance in the characteristics between the vaccine exposure groups. We considered a wide range of um, covariates and characteristics listed here, including sociodemographic, cardiovascular disease risk factors, other comorbidities in the prior year, healthcare utilization in the prior year, and vaccines received concomitantly with the index hepatitis B vaccine. Next. Next slide, please. We conducted several um, additional analyses. These include sensitivity analyses using alternative methods, specifically propensity score adjusted and stratified Cox proportional hazards models and uh, traditional multivariable Cox proportional hazards regression. And then we conducted sensitivity analyses for other outcomes for all types of AMI events and confirmed type 1 AMI plus indeterminate events which are the cases with disagreement from all three adjudicators. Next. We also performed subgroup analyses stratifying the cohort by age group and in subgroups of individuals with diabetes, hypertension, concomitant vaccine recipients, and those who received the index dose as the first ever hepatitis B vaccine or as a subsequent hepatitis B vaccination. Next. And next, please. So this table shows a vaccine accrual for HEPLOSAT-B and indirect B recipients. For those who received one, only one dose, those who received two doses, and those who received three doses during the accrual period from August 2018 to October 2019, with subsequent doses accrued through November 2020. So overall, there were 31,183 individuals who received at least one dose of HEPLOSAT-B and 38,400 42 individuals who received at least one dose of Indirect B. Next. So here I'm presenting standardized differences comparing the distribution of the wide range of characteristics we looked at between Hepatitis B and Indirect B recipients before and after inverse probability of treatment weighting. We have very large sample sizes in our study, so we use standardized differences instead of p-values. The standardized difference greater than 0.1 it's considered a significant difference. So the red triangles show standardized differences before IPTW, and these are all small, showing no significant differences between the two vaccine groups, except for race ethnicity, which is that red triangle on the right hand top corner. The black circles show standardized differences for IPT after IPTW, and they're all around zero, all in a straight line around zero, showing, and that's including for race ethnicity, showing that the IPTW achieved good balance of all these characteristics um, between the two vaccine groups. Next. This table shows the rates of AMI during the follow-up period for HEPLOSAT-B and indirect B recipients. There are 74 potential AMI events in the HEPLOSAT-B group, and 70.3% of these were confirmed to be type 1 AMI events. And then in the indirect B group, there were 128 potential AMI events with 55.5% confirmed to be type 1 AMI events. The AMI rate was 1.67 per 1,000 person years among Hubble B recipients and 1.86 per 1,000 person years among indirect B recipients. Next. And this Kaplan Meyer plot, the cumulative incidence of our primary outcome confirmed type 1 AMI was very similar throughout the follow-up period among Hepatitis B recipients, which is the red dashed line, and indirect B recipients, which is the black line. Next. This slide shows the final study results comparing the rate of type 1 AMI events in recipients of Hepatitis B versus indirect B. In the first row of the table, the adjusted hazard ratio for the primary analysis is 0.92, 
and the 95% confidence interval of 0.63 to 1.32 includes 1, so there is no evidence of significant difference in the rate of type 1 AMI comparing Hepostat B and Indirix B recipients. In addition, the upper bound of the confidence interval is less than 2, so we can rule out a doubling of the rate and reject our null hypothesis. In the sensitivity analyses using different analytic approaches, the other row shown here, we found consistently similar results. Next. In sensitivity analyses using alternative outcomes, first all type of AMI events, and second the confirmed type 1 AMI plus the indeterminate events, we find slightly lower adjusted hazard ratios that, uh, that also include 1. Next. So similarly, in all of our stratified and subgroup analyses, we find no evidence of a higher rate of AMI in Hepostat B recipients compared to indirect B recipients. Next. So our study has multiple strengths and limitations. And this is a, a real-world observational study in which hepatitis B vaccine is administered as part of routine healthcare delivery. Um, like all observational studies, there's potential for measured and unmeasured confounding. But we considered a wide range of sociodemographic and clinical covariates, and we used IPTW to adjust for confounding. Uh, we conducted predefined stratified and subgroup analyses and sensitivity analyses using alternative analytic approaches and outcome definitions. And we found consistent results for all of these. Misclassification of the vaccine exposure was possible, but we checked to ensure manufacturer and lot number descriptions matched the brand name. And we also conducted chart review of doses with potential discrepancies. Misclassification of the AMI outcome was also possible. However, all potential events were adjudicated by at least two cardiologist reviewers. There were more events from claims outside the KCSC health system in the indirect C group with a lower proportion adjudicated as definite or probable um, AMI. However, um, if all of these had been considered true AMI, the hazard ratio uh, for, HEPLS, for AMI comparing HEPLSAT B and indirect C groups would have been even lower. In addition, a strength of the study is a large and diverse study population in contrast to uh, the demographics of the pre-licensure trials. Next. So in conclusion, there's no evidence of an increased risk of AMI associated with vaccination with Hepostat B compared to Indirect B. Next. And I'd like to acknowledge the KPSC study team that contributed to this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent study. Um, the presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Dr. Lee, who did you call on? You cut out there for a sec. Oh, Dr. Daly. It's oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Sorry, I just didn't want to, I want to make sure I wasn't um, um, speaking ahead of someone. So th thanks for that excellent presentation. This is a clarifying question. Could you clarify for us <clears throat> um, what the risk window was for acute MI following vaccination? And then related to that, um, was there any clustering and how does that relate to when the acute MIs happen that were observed in the pre-licensure trials? Thank you. Um, so if we can go to slide 34, please, it's one of my additional slides. So the, the follow-up window uh, was 13 uh, months after the index dose. And the index dose was the first dose administered during the study period. But um, in this figure, this shows um, each type each type one AMI case is represented by a horizontal line. So this is just for Hepostat B. And the x-axis shows days since index dose. And then the, the um, cases, the AMI cases, are the red dots. Um, and the diagonal line connects the point with the smallest value in the x and y axis to the point with the largest value in the x and y axis. So if the AMI events occurred randomly, we'd expect them to, to follow a, um, that roughly follow the diagonal line, which they do mostly. So uh, this suggests that there's not 
much evidence of uh, temporal clustering of, of AMI for dose response. Thank you. Oh, thanks. All right, thanks. Are there any other questions for Dr. Brooksfort? Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. No, that was a really interesting and um, important study. My question is, uh, first of all, this was, you offered it to the, these patients routinely, irrespective of risk factors. And, and if that was the case, um, what, how many accepted, um, out of the, the you know, the, um, did you have a lot of re refusals as we consider routine immunization, um, was there, were there a lot of refusals for, for vaccination? Um, so we didn't actually interfere at all with how the vaccines were, uh, distributed. So we let the, the family medicine and internal medicine do what they normally do in terms of recommending hepatitis B vaccination. Um, the, the only thing that we did was ensure that one vaccine was available in one set of, of medical centers and another vaccine was available in another set of, of medical centers. So vaccine um, delivery was completely up to the, the physicians at those, like, across the health system. So that, that was, as usual, part of the routine, um, routine vaccination. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, may I ask, do you have a sense of percent, uh, percent coverage uh, across the sites for this population? No, we haven't assessed uh, in terms of who, who's at risk of, of hepatitis B and what uptake is among high-risk individuals. Thank you. Any other questions from members, liaisons, ex officio members? Okay, I see no other hands raised. So I think we will move on to Dr. Doshani presenting on uh, the evidence to recommendations framework for the universal adult hep B recommendation. Dr. There you are. Okay, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. With this presentation, we will look at the evidence to recommendation framework, ETR, for our question, should all unvaccinated adults receive hepatitis B vaccination? My name is Mona Dashani and I work as a medical epidemiologist at the CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis. And I will be presenting the ETR today. And I would like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Khan and Dr. Wang, who assisted with the development of the ETR as well. Next slide. This slide looks at the components of the PICO question. The population under consideration is previously unvaccinated adults 18 years or older. The intervention is a universal vaccination strategy using the two dose and three dose schedules. The comparison group is the current risk-based vaccination strategy using two dose and three dose schedules. The work group identified the following outcomes. Incidence of hepatitis B, morbidity related to hepatitis B, mortality related to hepatitis B, and serious adverse events associated with the two-dose vaccine. The last outcome was solely aimed at assessing the two-dose vaccine helpless FB, which was approved by FDA in 2017 and recommended by ACIP in 2018. The three-dose vaccines have already been extensively evaluated for their safety. The work group felt that the first set of outcomes, incidence, morbidity, and mortality, were important, while the second outcome, which is serious adverse events associated with the two-dose vaccine, was critical. Next slide. This table looks at the various domains of the evidence to recommendation framework that we will address today. Next slide. The first domain or criteria we looked at was public health problem. Next slide. To address this criteria, we first described the burden of hepatitis B in the United States. 
we found several studies that showed that in spite of existing resources for vaccination, screening, and treatment, and even after a reduction in incidence cases over the years, the burden of chronic hepatitis B disease was still substantial. People with chronic hepatitis B serve as a continued source of potential infection. Chronic hepatitis B prevalence estimates vary by data source and study methodology. During 2013 to 2018, an estimated 880,000 people were living with chronic hepatitis B infection, that is having a hepatitis B surface percentage and positive, and this was based on the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and Haines. Other modeling studies yielded higher estimates of prevalence, 1.59 million persons and another for 1.89 million. In 2019, data from death certificates filed in the vital records offices of the 50 states and DC demonstrated that hepatitis B age-adjusted death rate was 0.42 deaths per 100,000, which equated to about 1,662 deaths each year. Next slide. This slide looks at the acute hepatitis B infections in the United States. Unfortunately, it is seen here that over half of the acute hepatitis B cases reported in 2019 occurred among people aged 30 to 49 years. In 2019, there were 3,192 acute hepatitis B cases that were reported to the CDC National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, leading to an estimated 20,700 infections which was obtained after adjusting for case under ascertainment and under reporting. The graph on the right shows the rates of reported acute hepatitis B infections from 2004 to 2019 broken down by age group. In addition, two age groups seem to have a slight upward deflection since 2017, likely driven by the ongoing opioid epidemic. The 40 to 49 years group, which is denoted by the olive green line, and the 50 to 59 years group, which is denoted by the turquoise line over here. Next slide. This pie chart displays the 3,192 case reports of acute hepatitis B received by CDC for 2019, with the percent by risk behavior exposures identified, and the methods are footnoted on the slide. The information on risk behaviors and exposures were missing for 37% of the cases and more than one risk was reported for each case. Among the risk behaviors and exposures identified, it was seen that injection drug use was most commonly reported, followed by multiple sex partners. Next slide. This slide shows the goals of the US Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, which are similar to the CDC Division of Viral Hepatitis Elimination Plan. One of the goals of the HHS National Viral Hepatitis Strategic Plan is to reduce acute hepatitis B infections by 2030. The set national HHS target measure is to reduce acute hepatitis B infections 20% by 2025 and 90% by 2030. But with more than 95% of acute hepatitis B infections occurring in adults greater than 18 years of age, as reported by the CDC and NDS surveillance system, Having a universal vaccination recommendation in adults could have averted approximately 20,000 cases of acute hepatitis B infection. Next slide. To further address criteria one, we looked at the complications as a result of hepatitis B infections. Study by AL demonstrated that the population previously diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B infection has continued to age and if untreated, may progress to more advanced liver disease, such as decompensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver transplant, resulting in higher healthcare resource demands. Data from the US Sears Cancer Surveillance Program stated that by 2030, there will be 56,000 hepatocellular carcinoma cases, where nearly 10 to 15% of people with hepatocellular carcinoma were infected with hepatitis B. Looking at the burden of hepatitis B hospitalizations, each year more than $1 billion are spent in the United States on hepatitis B-related hospitalizations, which doesn't include indirect costs such as poor quality of life, reduced economic productivity, long-term disability, and premature death. Next slide. We found several studies that looked at missed opportunities in vaccination coverage among unvaccinated adults. These studies show that despite the universal vaccine recommendation in children and adolescents and in groups with risk factors, 
the vaccination coverage among adults was low and rising very slowly. This is where a universal vaccination recommendation in adults could help. The results from the 2018 National Health Interview Survey indicated that only 40% of adults aged 19 to 49 years and approximately 19% of adults aged 50 years and older had received three doses of hepatitis B vaccine. During 2013 to 2018, NHANES study estimated 21.4% of U.S. non-institutionalized population aged 25 years and older had vaccine-induced immunity to hepatitis B. We also saw low vaccination coverage among high-risk groups, which represents a substantial portion of the adult population. One study by Higher reported that 87% of individuals who were greater than 60 years of age with diabetes mellitus were unvaccinated. And another study reported that more than half of the women with more than one risk factor who visited or talked to the health professional in the past year were unvaccinated. Next slide. This graph shows the timeline of hepatitis B recommendations in the United States overlaid on hepatitis B virus incidents from 1980 to 2019. And it's just to point out that, first, in 1991, all U.S. infants were recommended for hepatitis B vaccination. So today, all people through age 30 should have been vaccinated against hepatitis B. Second, in 1999, because all U.S. children and adolescents through age 18 years were added to the hepatitis B recommendations, Today, all people through age 40 should have been vaccinated against hepatitis B. Next slide. So in the ACIP workgroup poll, the workgroup said yes to the question, is this problem of public health importance? Next slide. The next domain we looked at was benefits and harms. Next slide. The benefits for hepatitis B vaccine have been previously reviewed by ACIP and have been well established in terms of safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy. The vaccine offers over 90% protection among healthy adults who complete the three-dose series with rare adverse reactions. Immunogenicity lasts for at least three decades. More than 90% of people had evidence of protection 30 years after receiving the primary series. Studies have shown that immunocompetent people are protected even if the titles decline to less than 10 ml international units per ml. Next slide. Several studies have shown that in the last three decades, incidence of new hepatitis B infection has declined due to vaccine effectiveness. There has been a dramatic decrease of 68% in hepatitis B infection prevalence among children, which was observed within 10 years of initiation of a universal hepatitis B vaccination in 1991. We found no studies for universal vaccination among adults and found weak evidence related to vaccination among high-risk adults. Next slide. We also looked at a few studies among pregnant people under the HARMS criteria. One was a vaccine safety data link study that looked at hepatitis B vaccines administered in approximately 1,400 pregnant people, most commonly administered in the first trimester. This study showed no increased risk of adverse events among pregnant people or their infants. Also another study that is still ongoing due to insufficient data available on Hepless FB administered to pregnant people is the FDA pregnancy registry that is gathering information on outcomes following pregnancy exposure to Hepless FB. This study will be completed in 2023 Thus it, thus, it was advised until safety data in pregnancy are available for hepatitis B vaccines, providers should continue to vaccinate pregnant people needing hepatitis B vaccination with a vaccine from a different manufacturer. In addition, we looked at studies looking at hepatitis B vaccine co-administered with other vaccines and found no increased safety concerns. Next slide. Also under the benefits criteria, we found several studies that discussed the importance of vaccinating the general population before they develop chronic disease and other comorbidities, stating that people with chronic liver disease are known to have a decreased immunogenicity with a three-dose vaccine. We also found studies that showed lower seroprotection rates in persons with cirrhosis and chronic liver disease. Next slide. 
Lastly, under benefits, we looked at the cost-effective modeling study that you have heard in the previous ACIP meeting that compared the current vaccination recommendations and coverage with either a three-dose or two-dose universal hepatitis B vaccination series. The analytic horizon was 35 years, which is the age-specific life expectancy in the cohort. Universal adult vaccination against hepatitis B infection with either a two-dose or a three-dose vaccine series may increase percent of people protected, moving from a 23.7% in the current strategy to a 44.9% in a three-dose universal strategy and a 45.7% in a two-dose universal strategy. This table shows data on projected cases averted from that previous presentation for some of the outcomes examined, acute and chronic infections, hepatitis B-related deaths, and hepatocellular carcinoma. Next slide. Considering vaccination is already recommended for adults at increased risk, the primary analysis included a conservative base case that did not vary vaccination coverage among persons at increased risk. However, the actual implementation of a universal adult vaccination recommendation would likely result in an increase in vaccination among adults at an increased risk, in addition to the intended effects among the general population. The similarity of the modeled impact between three and two dose strategy is driven by the fact that there is a higher proportion of adults that complete the full series in a two dose strategy, but based on a smaller proportion of adults receiving protection from an incomplete series. The overall proportion of adults protected is similar. The purpose of this economic analysis was to show that regardless of which hepatitis B vaccine option was chosen for this particular question, Hepatitis B vaccination provides a benefit to the U.S. population. Next slide. Under the harms domain, the three-dose scheduled vaccines have been extensively evaluated for their safety. Overall, these hepatitis B vaccines have very mild side effects and adverse reactions. The estimated incidence of anaphylaxis following hepatitis B vaccine recipients is 1.1 per million vaccine doses. Here are some of the studies from the Vaccine Safety Data Link and a Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System that support the safety of the three-dose scheduled vaccines. Next slide. Under HOMS, we looked at hepless FB vaccine especially closely for reasons previously described. The Hep B CPG vaccine, or hepless FB, was recommended by ACIP in 2018 after few mild and severe adverse events were reported, as seen in this table, which assessed mild, serious, and cardiovascular events. This table is from an earlier systematic review and grade analysis that was published in the NMWR. Next slide. This slide shows a summary of our grade assessment for the cardiovascular and serious adverse events outcomes only. We did not find any studies comparing the two strategies, universal and risk-based, for adult hepatitis B vaccination and have no data on hepatitis B incidence, morbidity, and mortality. Hence, only these two outcomes were assessed. For cardiovascular events, we included five studies, four randomized control trials and one observational. In the pooled analysis of the four phase three randomized control trials, there were 41 cardiovascular events in the intervention arm, as seen in this column in the header hepatitis B surface antigen, adjuvant 1018, also known as hepless FB. And 16 events were seen in the comparator arm, which in the column header, as you will see, it's called hepatitis B surface antigen dash ENG, which is the NGRX B. The risk ratio was 1.33. However, this was not statistically significant. For the certainty assessment, we judged the risk of bias to be not serious. Inconsistency was rated as serious as a result for heterogeneous across trials. The I squared value was 43%, suggesting moderate heterogeneity. Indirectness was rated as not serious as the trials directly assessed the intervention and the outcome of interest. For imprecision, there were relatively few events and the 95% confidence interval could not exclude the possibility of no meaningful harm. So we assessed imprecision as serious and the overall certainty was assessed as low due to imprecision and inconsistency. And the importance of this outcome was rated as critical. The second 
study was the observational study that Dr. Brooks Ward presented today. There were 52 events in the intervention group and 71 events in the comparison group for a hazard ratio of 0.92. This was not statistically significant. For the certainty assessment, we judged the risk of bias to be not serious. Inconsistency and indirectness were rated as not serious. For imprecision, there were relatively few events, and the 95% confidence interval could not exclude the possibility of no meaningful harm. So we assessed imprecision as serious, and the overall certainty was assessed as very low due to imprecision, and the importance of this outcome was rated as critical. For serious adverse events, we included six studies, one phase two randomized control trial and five phase three trials. Overall, there were 528 events in the intervention group and 277 events in the comparator group for a risk ratio of 0.96. This was not statistically significant. For the certainty assessment, we judged the risk of bias to be not serious. Inconsistency was noted as not serious. The I squared value was 25%, suggesting low heterogeneity. Indirectness was rated as not serious and imprecision was not serious. The overall certainty was assessed as high and the importance of this outcome was rated as critical. So in conclusion, cardiovascular events were more common in the hapless FB arms of the randomized control trials compared to the NGRX B arms, but this difference was not statistically significant. Estimates were heterogeneous across trials and, imp and imprecise. In observational studies, a lower rate of cardiovascular events were observed in the hapless FP group compared to the NGRX B group, and the estimates were also imprecise. And the risk of serious adverse events was not significantly lower in the hapless FP arms of the randomized control trials. Next slide. Thus, for the question, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects the work groups said large. Next slide. So for the question, how substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? The work group said minimal. Next slide. For the question, do the desirable effects outweigh undesirable effects? The work group said favors intervention. Next slide. And for the overall certainty of evidence for the critical outcomes based on the grades assessment, the work group said, probably not important uncertainty. Next slide. The next domain is values and preferences. Next slide. Overall, we didn't find much information on values and preferences with respect to universal vaccination of hepatitis B in adults. Information we did find suggests that values and preferences vary by risk factor. Among adult patients in high risk settings, 47% of participants did not respond to the questions about risk factor. Very limited information on people with risk factor was available, and most of it was from refugees and immigrants born in highly endemic countries. A systematic review showed that 54 to 98% of participants knew that hepatitis B was a vaccine preventable disease and there was a wide variation across attitudes and confusion around benefits and side effects of vaccination. In a convenient sample study of Chinese American adult immigrants in Southern California, 60% reported feeling well and having no health problems and cited as a barrier for vaccination. And in another convenient sample among Vietnamese American immigrants, adults surveyed were not worried about getting hepatitis B or liver cancer but the participants expressed awareness of the benefits of vaccination and were not worried about getting liver disease after getting vaccinated. Next slide. For the question of whether the target population feels that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects, the work group said probably yes. Next slide. For the question, is the is there important uncertainty about or variability in how much people value the main outcome? The work group said probably not important uncertainty or variability. Next slide. The next domain we looked at 
was acceptability. Next slide. Under the acceptability domain, we found a few articles related to stakeholder support for universal adult hepatitis vaccination recommendation and improving adult immunization rates. Achieving high hepatitis B vaccination coverage in the United States among adults is a complex undertaking that requires active participation and coordination by a range of immunization stakeholders. In an expert meeting sponsored by a vaccine manufacturer, specialists in primary care, GI hepatology, infectious disease, travel medicine, and public health concluded that hepatitis B vaccination should be universally recommended for adults. And this strategy is the most practical approach to control hepatitis B in adults. Similarly, in a roundtable discussion at the America's Health Insurance Plan meeting, stakeholders discussed the importance of increasing vaccination rates and reducing ethnic and racial disparities. State stakeholders also expressed willingness to invest in hepatitis B vaccination programs for adults at increased risk. Next slide. In addition, we also found a national provider survey that assessed adult hepatitis B vaccination practices among 433 family medicine physicians and 420 internists in the United States. Displayed on this table are the factors in the roles that are grouped as definitely or somewhat a barrier to adult hepatitis B vaccination and factors that are, not, that are minor or not a barrier. 68% of providers felt that patients were not willing to disclose high-risk behaviors, and nearly 45% of providers reported that they were feeling too pressed for time to routinely access patients for risk factors. Nearly 65% of providers said that the lack of adequate reimbursement for vaccination and upfront cost of purchasing the vaccine was not a barrier. The survey also showed that patient and provider concerns about vaccine safety was definitely not a barrier to vaccinate. Next slide. The survey also addressed providers' perceived barriers on using standing orders given to nurses and medical assistants for identifying and vaccinating adults with risk factors. Around half the providers stated that nurses and medical assistants had questions about who should be immunized. And around half felt that the assessment of risk factors required a higher level of medical knowledge than what some nurses and medical assistants had. And 66% of providers felt that nurses and medical assistants are too pressed for time to assess patients for risk factors. Next slide. Next slide. The work group felt there was some uncertainty due to indirect evidence in the acceptability domain where the poll was split 50-50 as probably yes and yes to this question. Next slide. The next domain we looked at was resource use. Next slide. Shown here are the results from the sensitivity analysis from the economic evaluation presented to you at the ACIP meeting in February of 2021. This shows ICERS modeled for a couple scenarios of additional vaccination among people with increased risk for hepatitis B as an indirect result of a universal vaccination recommendation for the general population. Results from the three-dose alternate strategy are in the first row, and results from a two-dose strategy are on the second row. In the three columns, we first show the base case results, followed by the middle scenario, which allows an additional 20% of people at increased risk to be vaccinated on top of what you see in the base case. This is not a simple addition, partly because that additional coverage is only applied to the people in the risk factor groups and that are not already vaccinated. Another scenario, which is sensitivity analysis too, allows an additional 60% on top of what you see in the base case of people with risk factors to be vaccinated. While there isn't a specific source for the numerical value of these increased coverage assumption, Feedback received during the February ACIP meeting and during the hepatitis workgroup discussions 
indicate that additional vaccination would be plausible. Comparing the base case column and moving right, we see, we see that as vaccination increases among people with greater risk, the intervention becomes more cost effective. We noted that somewhat balanced estimates between the two and three dose strategies. As we know, all the models have uncertainties and the particular uncertainty of this model mainly hinges on the differences in adherence likelihood and cost between the two and three dose vaccines, as well as variants of risk among, across age groups as Dr. Hall presented in February, 2021. Next slide. The findings from this analysis indicate a universal adult hepatitis B vaccination strategy results in additional costs, but also additional qualities compared to the current strategy. The purpose of this economic analysis was to show that regardless of which hepatitis B vaccine option was chosen for this particular question, hepatitis B vaccination provides a benefit to the US population. Dr. Hall's study results indicate the costs and health benefits are very similar for universal vaccination strategy that utilizes a three-dose vaccination regime and a strategy that utilizes a two-dose vaccination regime. Furthermore, results hold true across a range of vaccination coverage scenarios and are robust against the influence of any single model assumption or input. Higher vaccination coverage in the intervention strategies resulted in better health outcomes. The average colleagues gained, life years gained, number of acute hepatitis B infections averted, number of hepatitis B-related deaths averted, all increased as vaccination coverage in the intervention strategy increased. Next slide. So for the question, is the universal vaccination strategy a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? The work group said yes. Next slide. The next domain we looked at was equity. Next slide. Racial disparity in hepatitis B infection rates showed slow improvement under the risk-based hepatitis B vaccination strategy. After 24 years of a risk-based policy, first recommended in 1982, among non-Hispanic Blacks, hepatitis B infection rates did decline, but remained over twice as high as among other racial ethnic populations. But most new hepatitis B infections occur in adults aged 19 years and older, and the rates among Black Americans are up to three times those of other racial ethnic minority groups. Furthermore, data from the 2019 surveillance report also showed that hepatitis B infection rates have increased among non-Hispanic whites due to outbreaks among people aged 30 to 39 years and who use injection drugs. We point out that after universal hepatitis B vaccination strategy for children and adolescents was implemented, the rates of hepatitis B disease for children and adolescents of all ages did converge to a lower rate. Next slide. There are still differences in hepatitis B vaccination coverage across race and ethnicity as seen in the middle percent column. This is reflected in the most recent 2018 National Health Interview Survey. Please note the disproportionate coverage in the white versus the other racial and ethnic minority groups. Next slide. It should be recognized that risk factors assessed include social structural factors that criminalize and stigmatize. For example, in the ongoing opioid crisis, Stigma associated with drug use may keep people from reporting risk factors to their clinicians. Currently, healthcare providers may rely on self-reported vaccine history to determine need for vaccination, but we all know that self-reported vaccination history does not predict immunity well. A universal vaccination re recommendation could eliminate the need for risk factor assessment prior to vaccination and reduce stigma among people who have been marginalized and at increased risk, and among immigrants with concerns about stigma associated with hepatitis B-related care. Next slide. So for the question, what would be the impact of the universal vaccination strategy on health equity? The work group felt that the universal vaccination strategy would increase health equity. Next slide. 
The next domain we assessed was feasibility. Next slide. Evidence supports that successfully implementing the current risk-based strategy can be challenging, as one CDC-funded pilot study showed lower vaccine acceptance than anticipated and lower series completion rates. Several studies note that physicians administer hepatitis B vaccination to adults at increased risk at suboptimal rates. In an urban HIV clinic, 30% of patients who were eligible were not offered the hepatitis B vaccine. During a meeting sponsored by a vaccine manufacturer, experts suggested that standing orders and consistent recommendations from professional societies and government agencies may address some implementation obstacles. And a study on electronic provider reminders in California demonstrated an increase in hepatitis B initiation rate among adults with diabetes by 70-fold and series completion improved by 20-fold, demonstrated that electronic provider reminders can be a good tool to achieve series completion of hepatitis B vaccination. Next slide. Another aspect brought about by the voting committee in February was are we missing opportunities to vaccinate in the older adult groups as they might be going in to see their physicians more often? Among adults with no risk factors and one or more risk factors, we see lower hepatitis B vaccination coverage among adults aged 50 years and older compared to those aged 19 to 49 years, likely due to the universal hepatitis B vaccine recommendation for children and adolescents. The graph below compared the national flu coverage over time, which was higher in the 50 years and older age group, suggested that vaccine coverage among older adults can be increased. This slide is more about adult vaccine coverage and where we get the biggest gains, so creating access where they might be going in and seeing their physician. Next slide. Evidence supports that either a two-dose or a three-dose vaccine schedules are effective, but the two-dose vaccines may be of higher value in the populations with certain risk factors, whereby the two-dose vaccine could lead to higher series completion rates. In regards to insurance coverage, the Affordable Care Act requires coverage of routinely recommended vaccines with no cost sharing, with some caveats. Finally, the Hepatitis Workgroup recognizes its mandate to primarily address the role of vaccination policy without rolling testing guidelines into a policy decision for an ACIP vote. Meanwhile, Hepatitis Workgroup understands that Hepatitis B testing guidelines, such as the universal testing approach and practical considerations are concurrently being developed by a parallel process with goals to release new testing guidelines around the same time with robust clinical guidance to accompany that. We understand that the screening piece is important but we do know that we don't want screening and testing to be a barrier to access to vaccination. Next slide. So for the question, is the universal vaccination uh, strategy feasible to implement? The work group felt yes, the universal vaccination strategy is feasible to implement. Next slide. So that's the summary, next slide. Here is the table showing the summary of the workgroup judgments that were discussed for each of the domains. Next slide. In conclusion, the workgroup felt the desirable consequences clearly outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. Next slide. And so draft policy recommendation for ACIP for consideration is, all adults previously unvaccinated for hepatitis B should receive hepatitis B vaccination. Next slide. Thank you. And following this slide, um, we have listed a few references. So if you could go next, 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 next. Thank you. Thanks. And then I would like to acknowledge uh, our colleagues here at CDC, and if you could go to the next slide, please, and our hepatitis work group members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goshani. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Lair. 
I want to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And I also want to acknowledge that this is one of my first ACIP meetings and I haven't been on the ACIP for very long. But I have a few comments and one question. Overall, I'm concerned that the evidence to recommendation framework is extraordinarily optimistic. I feel that the benefits are probably being overemphasized and I'm concerned about some of the data and the interpretations. Um, I feel that this decision is gonna be recommending vaccines for hundreds of millions of people. And that is many of those people do not have any disease and they do not actually have any risks. This isn't like flu or COVID where you can walk outside in the grocery store and get exposed. This is a risk-based disease. And so I think what we're trying to do is we're saying we're not doing a good enough job right now. Let's just vaccinate everybody to get things covered. In addition, while I think that would work, I think it would be very expensive. And at least I would suggest to the work group that they break it down into age cohorts. If you go back to Dr. Hall and Dr. Rosenberg's study in February of 2021, it was pretty clear that for the age 60 to 60, uh, over 60 and the 50 to 59, the quality was about $500,000. So while there is a benefit of about 100 to $150,000 per quality mentioned in this presentation, that's different for, for different ages. So I'm concerned about that. My specific question is regards to the number needed to vaccinate. So if you look on slide 38, you'll see a number needed to vaccinate of about 370 to 380 people. My concern is that that's per 100,000 people if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's to prevent one infection. So then what I did was I estimated how many people would be prevented if I were to vaccinate 100,000 people, and that would be about 270 cases of acute infection would be prevented based on that number. However, on slide six, the incidence of acute infection is about one to two per 100,000 per year, and that two numbers, orders of magnitude difference just didn't make sense to me. So I'm curious if someone could explain that to me. Thank you. Sure. Um, so just, um, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things that were discussed in the ACIP work group regarding the age and why we went with the universal vaccination recommendation. One of the things that were discussed, it was, um, um, and this was, uh, a discussion that we had over and over again, where they felt like a simplified recommendation would help improve the vaccination coverage and also help uh, in terms of, um, we see a lot of older adults uh, who come in with uh, higher risk conditions, and this would greatly help to increase the vaccination rate as well as, um, so that was one of the reasons um, the work group felt very strongly as to include um, a more wider range. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for your feedback for that question. For the next question, I'd like to direct that to um, either Dr. Hall or Dr. Uh, Andrew Leitner. Um, basically, um, one of the things that on this slide is we're just capturing data from our surveillance report. Uh, which is, uh, we, we know that is very underreported and we're really not looking at chronic hep B infections. Um, and, um, and for the slide uh, on the um, cost-effective analysis, if uh, Dr. Hall or Lander could comment on that further, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Actually, before we go there, what I'm going to suggest is I'll take as many questions as we can and then um, Dr. Joshani, you, uh, feel free to call on whoever you would like to answer the series of questions, uh, just in terms of efficiency, because we are at the end of our time. Uh, Dr. Daly. Um, so I just wanted to um, ask a very similar question to what was just asked by, doc by Dr. Lair. So just whether the work group considered an upper bound on universal at age 50 or 60 or 65, and you don't need to answer that because 
because you've already provided the answer, but I had the same question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Yeah, I'm going to actually um, be on the other side. I think it's incredibly important for older adults to be um, considered in this um, older adults. Um, the same shock some of you, but are still sexually active, and many of them are looking at new sexual partners. Um, and some of them actually do um, use IV drugs. So I, I think that we really need to include them. Now, is it cost effective? Maybe not. But is it important to prevent disease spread? I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Talbot. Um, Dr. Bell. Uh, thank you. Um, not meaning to pile on, um, but um, I, I do uh, want to ask if I understand, I mean, I do understand that the interest by, on the part of the work group in um, making a universal hepatitis B vaccination is essentially um, meant to be a roundabout way to increase vaccination coverage among people in risk groups um, because that's where the disease is occurring. And um, I really wonder if are there is there any evidence is there any data are there any other vaccines or other situation in which we've actually seen other than the childhood thing which is I think is a little bit different situation where we've actually seen that by making universal coverage we actually increase cover uh, universal recommendation we increase coverage among a risk group. Um, and uh, so, I, again, you probably don't really have to answer this because you more or less told us, you know, what the work group's feeling was. But I, I have to say that I'm a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not sure that we actually have any evidence to suggest that we're going to achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve with this strategy. Um, thank you. Dr. Goldman. Thank you. So currently, the and let me just preface by saying I'm a big fan of universal recommendation uh, as it really does simplify the strategy for physicians and recommendations to our patient. But the current CDC vaccine schedule says for hepatitis B, routine vaccination is for any also not at risk but want protection from hepatitis B. So how would this proposed uh, strategy differ from what we already have now, which allows for anyone who feels they want protection can get it. Uh, Dr. Doshani, do you want to take that? And then actually, um, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Leitner to chime in regarding the first question. Sure. Um, if uh, I would like if Dr. Nelson could answer that question. Sure. Um, so the recommendation that anyone who um, wants vaccine can have it um, kind of puts the the onus on the um, on the person to to request um, vaccine. Um, where we're proposing a universal recommendation, um, where the, the provider would be offering vaccine to to everyone, all adults. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leitner. Are you available? Yes, I'm available. I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so regarding the difference between the number needed to vaccinate uh, and the annual incidence, um, I, I just have a couple of thoughts that occurred to me. Um, but then like you, you, you could do like a more uh, technical analysis of this question to, to just make sure that everything does make sense. But my first pass at it was that um, annual incidence is kind of measured across everyone uh, and, it, and it's one year at a time, but the number needed to vaccinate, that comes from vaccinating a subpopulation because there is like in that model, I, I'm trying to recall, I think there is um, some criteria where you find people who either don't have vaccine protection or, or haven't had past infection and you vaccinate those individuals. And then the cases you avert or prevent from vaccination, those are collected over the lifetime of the person after they got the vaccine in the model. So it would kind of add up those annual incidences over the, the remaining lifetime of that person after they got vaccinated. Um, those are my 
those are my quick thoughts on that. And so I think we can follow this up with a more technical uh, investigation once I talk to Dr. Hall. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any additional hands raised. I really appreciate the um, rapid fire answers. Uh, we do need to take a brief break before we go to our last session. We are running behind. Um, so uh, we will do our best, but why, not, why doesn't everyone take a, a five minute break? Uh, we'll return at um, 23 after the hour. Thank you very much.